Paul Weber with Eiffel Software. In this presentation, let's see how the Eiffel language looks next to Java. First, we'll review Java's history and what makes it a special contribution to software development. Then I want to talk about some selected differences in syntax between Java and Eiffel, as well as language usage and capabilities. In this comparison, remember we're talking primarily about Eiffel the language, which is only a portion of the Eiffel development framework. And the same goes for Java. We'll be talking mostly about the Java language and API, and not so much about all the other supporting technologies. But even though our aim may be to note differences in syntax and language features, we'll take time to examine how those differences affect the way we construct software. You may be surprised to see that many of the features of Java don't have counterparts in Eiffel. This means that in Eiffel there are fewer things you have to learn and deal with. And you get even better functionality because those features that are in Eiffel are carefully chosen to make it unnecessary to have as many special facilities as you see in Java and C Sharp. Of course it would be impossible to do a comprehensive comparison of Java and Eiffel in the amount of time we have for this short presentation but I hope to cover some of the areas that account for the most profound differences in development culture or are the most frequently misunderstood. Java has its syntactical roots strongly in the C programming language, as does Microsoft's C Sharp. So some of the syntax and even the language differences will be the same as those in C Sharp. I'll try not to be too repetitive for those who view both this and the C Sharp presentation. In fact, I hope that even if you're mostly concerned with Java, you'll watch the C-Sharp presentation too. That's because there are similar facets in both languages that in the interest of brevity I'll discuss in detail only in one of the presentations. All the same, if you've already seen the C-Sharp talk and you start to get an overwhelming feeling of deja vu while you're watching this one, you can use the navigation controls on the left to skip past the current slide, and you won't hurt my feelings one bit if you do. Let's start by talking some about the history of Java and why Java has been important to software development. Where did Java come from? Well, the history web pages at Sun Microsystems tell it this way. In 1991, Sun formed a small team dedicated to exploiting the future directions of computing. The team peered into their crystal ball, and they saw the convergence of digital devices and computers. Specifically, they decided to target the cable television market. They worked to develop some home entertainment control devices, and in doing so, they created as a tool a platform-independent programming language, which would eventually become Java. Well, it turned out that the cable industry was a bit immature at the time for the new technology, so the team found a more willing market in the Internet. About this time, around 1993, the Internet browser Mosaic arrived on the scene. The team at Sun built a browser somewhat like Mosaic, but based on Java technology. This browser was eventually named Hot Java. Hot Java was demoed showing web pages with dynamic, animated content, controlled by client-side software. And so Java and client-side web computation were off to the races. In May of 1995, the official Java announcement was made at SunWorld, and it included the added kicker that an agreement had been reached in which Java technology was to become an integral part of the popular web browser Netscape Navigator. Java as a whole has many technological goals, like distributed computing and multi-threaded execution but the Java language has some specific design goals. Three of Java's primary design goals are simplicity, object orientation, and familiarity. The remainder of this presentation may give you some perspective on how well these goals have been achieved. When you look at a little Java code, it's pretty obvious that Java has a C-like syntax. Yet for the sake of simplicity, Java shunned many of the features of C and C++ that are generally considered troublesome or redundant. And it's a pretty long list. It includes things like the preprocessor, type defs, defines, structures, unions, enums, the go-to statement, and pointers. To the majority of the items on this list, most mature software engineers will say good riddance. 
but the Java designers also threw out some things that can be safe and helpful if implemented properly, in particular multiple inheritance and operator overloading. So even though Java has the goal of object orientation, it's less object oriented than it could be if it had included safe and controllable implementations of multiple inheritance and operator overloading. Java looks like C for the sake of familiarity. So folks who went through the arguably tedious process of learning C or C++ would not have to abandon that body of knowledge completely in order to learn Java. This sounds okay, but we'll see that the goals of simplicity and familiarity are to some extent mutually diminishing. That is, the more Java looks like C for the sake of familiarity, the more of C's complex baggage it retains. Likewise, the more Java was simplified, the less it looked and acted like C. So the Java that we use today is a compromise attempt to meet all its goals, as I suppose are all programming languages. When the people at Sun Microsystems speak of the Java platform, they mean a combination of a set of basic software components called the Java API and the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM for short. The JVM, in combination with something called bytecode, is what makes Java run on multiple platforms. There's a JVM provided for each platform on which Java is supported. So rather than compiling the machine code for each platform, Java source code is compiled to Java bytecode, which is common for all platforms. Then at runtime, the bytecode is interpreted by the JVM running on some specific target platform. The JVM controls execution and provides automatic memory management. This approach is not entirely different from the approach that the Eiffel designers took nearly a decade before the Java announcement. For all platforms, Classic Eiffel compiles to standard ANSI C, and then a platform-specific C compiler compiles the C code into an executable system. As with Java, automatic memory management is built in. But in contrast to Java, when you deliver an Eiffel system, the system runs as a native image on the target platform. In fact, one of our customers told us this. We've found that in practice, ISE Eiffels write and generate once then compile anywhere turns out to be superior to Java's attempt to write once run anywhere. Still, the improvement of portability by writing software once and running it on diverse platforms with little or no change can improve an organization's software economics dramatically. For example, if you're in the position of migrating from one platform to another, the migration will be less costly if you can avoid software rewrites. And if you're marketing a software product, you can open new markets on different platforms at less cost if you're using development tools that enhance portability like Eiffel and Java. Okay, now we want to look at some differences in syntax between Java and Eiffel and how they make a difference in software development. Case sensitivity is a subject that is well, pretty sensitive. It seems that most programmers have a fairly strong opinion about whether programming languages should or should not be case sensitive. Java is case sensitive, while Eiffel is not case sensitive. So I polled some developers and I asked them if they had a preference and why. Despite the fact that the arguments on both sides are often highly passionate, I think most of what I heard boils down to a statement that goes kind of like this. I want my programming language to be. Now choose one of the following. A, case sensitive, or B, not case sensitive. Because it prevents me from doing certain stupid things. Unfortunately, because my language is, now whichever choice you made earlier, case sensitive or not case sensitive, it will allow me to do certain other stupid things. So I've developed conventions that help prevent me from doing those things. So even though Java is case sensitive, there are conventions that govern the use of case. And even though Eiffel is not case sensitive, there are conventions that govern the use of case. So the argument can only be about which stupid things are the stupider. Bjorn Strustrup, designer of the C++ language, once wrote that it would be unwise to choose names that differed only by case.
even though case-sensitive languages like C++ and Java would allow it. And I think he's right. Obviously, a situation like this has a potential to cause confusion. So different things should have different names, and the difference should not depend solely upon the case of the text. If you coded the equivalent in a non-case sensitive language like Eiffel, like this, the declarations would be invalid because all three versions of the my variable names would be considered the same name. But what you could do in Eiffel is code one of these declarations and then use it in different places with different case, like this. Now the compiler understands that all of my variable things here reference the same entity regardless of case, but it's likely that this type of coding would cause confusion to a human reader. As a result, the Eiffel Convention specifies that names for features, which you can compare to variable and method names in Java, are constructed of complete words in all lower case with underscores separating the words, like this. Class names are constructed in the same way but use all uppercase, as you see here with the class name integer. Now I want to clear up one more thing. I saw a post on one of the forums in which the poster claimed to prefer case-sensitive languages because they would allow him or her to do something like this. Here an entity name has been coded which has the same name as its type, except for the case. It turns out that even though you can code this in case-sensitive languages, it's not necessarily because the languages are case-sensitive. That is, a language does not have to be case-sensitive to allow it. In fact, you can do exactly the same thing in Eiffel, which is not case-sensitive. You can do this because the language is designed so that the identifiers which are feature names are not confused with the identifiers which are class names. Still, I think most Eiffel programmers would avoid this practice in respect for the guidance that different things should have different names. You may have noticed on the previous slide that declarations in Java follow the C pattern of declarations, specifying the type first. The problem with the type first approach of the C family of languages is that if we're trying to find our way around an unfamiliar code, mostly we won't go looking for declarations by their type. More likely, we'd be looking for the declaration for a name that we had seen while trying to understand some portion of the procedural code. In his book, Objects Unencapsulated, Ian Joyner writes that the C style of declaration is like having a dictionary in which the entries are listed with their part of speech first. So if you scan down the left hand of the page, you'd see noun, adjective, verb, noun, adverb, etc. So it would be harder to find the words for which you wanted definitions. And that's the way it is with the C style declarations. It was that way in C, and in the name of familiarity, it's that way in Java, and in C Sharp too. To make matters even worse, as in this case, the type will likely be preceded by modifiers, things like public, final, or static. Eiffel specifies the entity name first, then the type, similar to the way it's done in mathematical notation and in some other programming languages. Because the name appears first and won't be preceded by modifiers, a declaration for some particular name is easier to find. Arrays have been built into many programming languages, from Fortran and COBOL to C-sharp and Java. Arrays mimic indexable arrangements of items in storage. So in Java, arrays are built in, and you would declare an item of an array type like this. Here, century is an array of items of type year. In Eiffel, there's no special built-in language facility for arrays. Arrays are just classes in Eiffel. They're type-safe container classes, but they're not special language features. They're just classes. What has made this possible in Eiffel, where in Java and C-sharp it was not, is a capability that we call genericity, or generics. Generics are now just about to make their debut in Java and C-sharp, but they've been in Eiffel since the original design in 1985. Here's a declaration for century in Eiffel as an array of objects of type year. 
In the Java procedural code, an array creation expression is used to create the array object. So here, century is attached to a new object, which is an array of items of type year with space enough to support 100 entries. These entries will be indexed from 0, representing the first entry, to 99, representing the 100th entry. Arrays in Java are always 0 based. This is the way it was in C, because C was modeled to some degree after an assembler language, which used memory offsets versus true indexes. So item number one in storage was located at address offset zero. Accomplished C, C++, Java, and C Sharp programmers have learned to think this way, but I don't think there's much justification for this type of thinking in modern programming. In Eiffel, Century gets created just like any other object, with the create keyword and a call to a creation procedure, in this case the procedure make. Make takes two integer arguments, which are the minimum and maximum index values. So this code creates century with indexes 0 through 99, like the Java array. But if you wanted the indexes to correspond to the entry number versus the entry number minus 1, you could create century this way. And no experienced Eiffel programmer would intentionally create a zero-based array for a structure that itself was not inherently zero-based. In Java, if you wanted to model some particular century, like the 20th century, with an array, well, you'd do it the same way you did century, and then you'd write code to translate the actual year number to the proper index in the array. With Eiffel, you could create a more accurate model by making the indexes correspond exactly with the way that you would speak of the particular years of that century. One more thing about arrays. Once an array is created in Java, it can't be resized. If a larger array is needed at runtime, then a new array must be created and populated from the old array. Arrays in Eiffel are resizable at runtime. The Eiffel compiler and runtime environment give arrays special treatment to ensure that they're both mutable and machine efficient. Nearly all programming languages use a mixture of words and symbols to construct compilable software source text. The tricky part of this is that the software text must be decipherable unambiguously by a compiler and readable and understandable by human beings. Java mimics C, which used a lot of symbols, and so Java does too. Eiffel tends more toward the use of English words, and there's a reason for that. Let's use this if statement to examine some of the differences. In particular, we'll see how Eiffel is different concerning outer parentheses on conditions, the symbols for the test of equality, and, and or, the braces used to delineate blocks of code, the assignment operator, the terminating semicolon, and the logical complement. That seems like a lot of stuff, but it's not so bad. Let's take a look at the Eiffel version of this if statement. The Eiffel if statement does not require parentheses around the whole conditional, but parentheses can be used, as you see here, to group expressions. For a test of equality, a single equal sign is used. For assignment, a colon equal. The Eiffel keyword AND is used for the logical AND. The keyword OR is used for the logical OR. And the keyword NOT is used for the logical complement. Notice that the braces are not needed in Eiffel. The keyword END is used to terminate code structures in Eiffel. In Java, sometimes you can use the short version of the IF, as in C, to avoid the braces. But this practice enables the so-called dangling else problem and can cause readability issues, too. So many style guides, including Sun's own, recommend using the braces always. In Eiffel, you have to code the end keyword, but you never have to enclose blocks of code in braces, and there's never the dangling else issue. This style leads to conditional statements that are arguably more readable. And lastly, the semicolon. Java uses a semicolon as a terminator on each statement. Eiffel allows a semicolon, but as a statement separator versus a terminator. 
but the semicolon in Eiffel is only required in some cases of multiple statements per line and therefore is hardly ever used by Eiffel programmers. So the Java syntax was designed with a goal of familiarity for those developers who are already C or C++ programmers. But in the case of Eiffel, one of the design goals is to provide a language that works well across the entire software development life cycle. As such, it needs to be readable, not just by programmers, but by a variety of other project members and clients too, people with varying backgrounds. Now let's examine how some language differences affect the way that software gets produced. Whenever I work on one of these presentations, I learn something. For example, as I was reading Sun Microsystems' white paper on the Java language environment, I came upon this statement, Java has no functions. Now this surprised me. Java has methods. Well, I knew that. For a few years I was a small talk programmer, so I recognized and understood the method and message metaphor that Java adopted from the small talk world. But I thought, and maybe I thought this because Java looks like C and C++, that methods that return values would still be called functions. And in fact they are, informally at least, by many Java programmers. But officially, they're called methods. And what this statement, Java has no functions, really means is that there are no routines in Java that A, are called functions, and B, exist outside of the context of a class. Certainly code like this, that models the function f of x equal x plus 1, must be valid in Java, and indeed it is but it is only valid as a method in a class and only callable when targeted to an object as we see here. Even more like C-style functions are the static methods which are always called without reference to a particular object. In this example, the static method to compute the absolute value is being called. Other than the fact that Java static methods don't go floating about outside the context of a class, I don't see much difference between this and a C-style function call. In other words, by using static methods, you could write old-style programs just like in C, based on top-down, functionally decomposed designs, versus the object-oriented designs that Java is supposed to encourage. So in Java, executable code is written in methods. And even though methods technically may not be functions, they all declare some return type even if that type is void. Additionally, executable code can be written in constructors, which are used at object creation and are not considered to be methods. We'll see more about constructors in a moment. In Eiffel, all executable code belongs to some routine, and routines come in two types, procedures and functions. The distinction between a procedure and a function is simple. A procedure has no return value a function has a return value. So in a way you could think of procedures as similar to void methods. There are no static routines in Eiffel. Every procedure and function must be a feature of some class and every call to such a routine must be targeted to an object. So all programming is at least technically, if not philosophically, object-oriented. Well that's the way it is in classic Eiffel. Because Eiffel is a fully compliant player in Microsoft.NET, it's necessary sometimes to call static functions on .NET library types, so a facility for doing so is now actually available in Eiffel. Getting back to procedures and functions, though, there's a difference in the way that procedures and functions are used by Eiffel programmers. Procedures are used in cases in which the target object may be modified. Functions are used to compute the answer to some question about the target object, but don't change the target object. So for example, for a class that models a bank account, the routine deposit would be a procedure which caused some amount of money to be deposited into the account. An example of a function might be the account's balance, which would compute and return the current account balance from the account's deposits and withdrawals. 
The reason routines are used in this way in Eiffel is well thought out and important for writing reliable software. It's rooted and designed by contract. So here in a bit of unabashed advertising, I want to recommend that if you have not yet viewed the design by contract presentations on this site, you should do so. They'll help give you a better appreciation for why Eiffel programmers think this way. In both Java and Eiffel, at runtime, references to objects are initially null or void references. At some point in execution, typically an object is created, initialized, and attached to the reference. The mechanisms for the initialization differ between the environments, though. Java uses a concept of constructors similar to C++ and C Sharp. A constructor is a special routine that has the same name as the class it serves. Here's an example of a Java declaration of an instance variable called myPoint of type point, followed by the procedural code that creates a new object of type point using the constructor and assigns the reference to myPoint. New is a Java keyword used for object creation. Now here's the corresponding code in Eiffel. First there's a declaration for myPoint. Then somewhere in the procedural code, an object gets created. In the Eiffel creation code, Create is a language keyword that indicates that a new instance of point is to be created. Make is a creation procedure for objects of type point. So you can see the similarity between constructors in Java and creation procedures in Eiffel. But there are some differences. For one thing, constructors are required to have the same name as the class. Because of the concept of overloading, you can have multiple constructors for a class if their argument lists differ. Creation procedures in Eiffel are just ordinary procedures. They can have any name that's valid for a class feature, although by convention creation procedure names begin with the word make. So what makes these procedures creation procedures? Well, each class that can have direct instances at runtime contains a list of the names of its procedures which can be used to initialize a new object at creation time. So any procedure named in the list is a creation procedure. In this example, in the Eiffel class point, the procedure make would have its name listed as a creation procedure. Each Eiffel class can have multiple creation procedures. One advantage to creation procedures comes from their flexible naming policy. In the example here, we might assume that the two floating point arguments here represent the x and y coordinates for the point on a Cartesian grid. Well, what if we wanted to build a constructor to create a point using polar coordinates versus Cartesian coordinates? Then our new constructor would take two floating point arguments just like the constructor for Cartesian coordinates. And this would be invalid in Java because of the rules of overloading. They say that each overloaded method must have a difference in the arguments. In Eiffel, we would just create another procedure with a different name, say make polar that accepted the two floating point arguments for rho and theta. And we'd add make polar's name to the list of creation procedures. Apart from naming, creation procedures differ from constructors in two other important ways. First, they can be applied to existing instances. Java constructors can only be used when an object is created. But a creation procedure can be called repeatedly on an existing instance whenever it's necessary to reinitialize it. So a call to points make procedure to reinitialize an instance would look just like a creation call, but omitting the create keyword. The last difference I want to mention deals with the responsibility for object integrity. One of the most commonly seen and difficult problems to debug in object-oriented development occurs when objects become invalid at runtime. And the longer a broken object goes undetected at runtime, the more damage it can do to the objects related to it, and the harder it is to trace the problem. So we want objects to be valid from the time of their creation until the time of their destruction. That means that after the constructor or creation procedure completes, an object must be in a valid state. Java doesn't support design by contract, so there's nothing in the software that says what it means for an object to be valid. Consequently, object validity may be left open to interpretation. Nor is there any facility in Java at runtime to verify objects' validity during execution. So invalid objects can go undetected until things really get ugly. 
In Eiffel, a class level assertion called the class invariant defines valid state for an instance of a class. The creation procedure is responsible for making certain that newborn objects meet the class invariant before being allowed out into the world. At runtime, if an object ever assumes an invalid state, that is, its class invariant becomes violated, an exception occurs immediately, allowing us to locate and fix the bug that caused the problem before it really stinks up the joint. The class invariant also relieves Eiffel of an inheritance-related constructor restriction that exists in Java. A constructor from an air class in Java must call its parent's constructor. It can happen either by an explicit call using super or by an implicit call to the parent's noarg constructor. This is intended to guarantee initialization of the portion of an object's state that's inherited from the parent. In Eiffel, there's no such restriction. You see, the class invariant is inherited from the parent, and that's what really counts. It doesn't matter whether the code that causes the invariant to hold true is in the parent class or in the heir class, so long as the invariant holds true when the creation procedure completes. Java includes certain built-in types called primitive types. There's a language keyword for each of these types. Primitive types in Java can also be called value types and they're the only value types in Java. All other types are reference types. Here's the difference. Suppose you create a class called A, and in A you define instance variables X and Y. X is a value type, say double, and Y is of a reference type, say string. At runtime, the data for variable X, as with all value types, is stored directly in any instance of A that's created. For the reference type variable y, an instance of a includes only a reference to the object data for y which exists in allocated memory somewhere outside the instance of a. This reference looks like a pointer, and in a way it is. But the important thing to understand is that in Java, and of course in Eiffel too, it's not possible or necessary to manipulate the reference directly, like you do when you do pointer arithmetic in C. Even though there are important differences between the Java approach and the Eiffel approach, this particular example would be almost identical in Eiffel. Eiffel supports expanded types, which are in many ways like value types in Java, and Eiffel supports reference types. So class A in Eiffel looks like this. And because double is an expanded type and string is a reference type, the runtime structure looks essentially the same as in Java. So what's different? Well, there are a couple of things I want to show you. First, in Java, the only value types are those primitive types in the list we saw earlier. All others are reference. In Eiffel, classes are reference unless they are designated as expanded. So every type could potentially be an expanded type. Well, there is one restriction related to object initialization, but the point is that the designer of a class can decide whether it's generally better for its instances to be expanded or referenced. Here, engine is an expanded class, so an instance of it will be embedded in each instance of automobile. Also, a particular declaration of an attribute of some type that would ordinarily be referenced can be designated as expanded for that particular attribute, also subject to the same restriction I mentioned before. So here, even though engine is now a reference class, the attribute power is declared as an expanded instance of engine in the class automobile. And this makes sense from a modeling standpoint. For example, every normally functioning automobile will have one engine. That engine is contained in a particular automobile and is not shared by any other automobile. So it's possible that a designer might designate the attribute that represents a car's engine as expanded, therefore contained within runtime instances of automobile. Likewise, each automobile might be associated with a manufacturing plant where it was assembled, but that plant is shared by many automobiles and so would likely be a reference type. The second thing I want to mention is that the primitive types in Java are not really first-class citizens from an object-oriented standpoint. And that's because there are no classes to support these types. 
In fact, instances of these types are not technically considered objects in Java. The problem with this is that there is only a unified type system within class types or reference types. All these primitive types have their own semantics that just have to be known by programmers. In other words, you can't look up the int class in the library documentation the same way you would some other class, say string. It turns out that in the Java library, there are classes that correspond to each of the primitive types. So for example, the class integer corresponds to type int. These classes wrap an instance of the primitive type. So they provide reference semantics for primitive types, but they also add functionality. There are methods that can be applied to integers that can't be used on the primitive type int. Unfortunately, an instance of integer can't be treated like an instance of int. Suppose, for example, that we have one declaration of type int and one declaration of type integer. We can initialize the int by assigning a literal. But we can't assign a literal to the integer. Instead, we have to create a new instance of integer, passing the value we want as an argument to the constructor, then make the assignment. Likewise, when we add 20 to the int, it's pretty straightforward. But when we want to add 20 to the instance of integer, things get a bit awkward. In Eiffel, the basic types like integer and double are expanded types, so they're accessed by value. But unlike Java, each is represented by a class in the class library. Of course, sometimes it's necessary to be able to use these types with reference semantics. So like Java, Eiffel has a second set of classes that are reference classes corresponding to the expanded classes. But in Eiffel, the expanded classes inherit from their reference counterparts. And this means that the use of the corresponding types is almost identical. Here is the Eiffel equivalent of the Java code we saw earlier. There's an instance of the expanded or value type and an instance of the reference type. But notice that the code in which the attributes are initialized and added to is consistent across the integer types. Sun's online Java tutorial says that Java has three branching statements. They're break, continue, and return. Conspicuously absent is the go-to statement. The Java designers, understanding how much trouble the unrestricted transfer of control can cause, decided to leave it out of the language. However, they did choose to leave in these restricted versions of GoTo, along with throw, which is another statement that causes an immediate transfer of control. Java allows both break and continue statements to include a label as a target. This is another way that Java breaks, to use an appropriate pun, with the C-style traditions. It allows these statements to be used in the same fashion as the GoTo was in other C-style languages. Specifically, a break with a label can be used to terminate an outer loop, as you see in this snippet, which is similar to the one on the Java tutorial examples. Here's a nested loop for searching for an element in a two-dimensional array. Once the element's found, the code breaks out of both loops by using a break targeted to the label search. Now, one Java author criticizes the labeled break as just a substitute for the expunged to go to statement. But I think that's unfair. In Java, you can only use the labeled break in situations like the ones you see here. It can't be used in an unrestricted go to any place fashion like the old C go to. So the Java design is definitely an improvement over C and C++. Having said that, though, we really must admit that the branching statements are not necessary at all. In fact, they could have been designed out of the Java language entirely if it were not for certain artifacts from the past that have been brought forward in Java, like the strange workings of the C-style switch statement in which the code from one case falls into subsequent cases. So again, in a way, the importance of familiarity keeps us from moving away from the mistakes of the past. Eiffel, on the other hand, has no branching statements. Flow of control is affected by calling routines and by built-in facilities for selection, that is, if-then-else, and iteration, that is, looping. You might think that as a result, it would be awkward to do things in Eiffel, but that's not really the case. 
Let's take a look at some Eiffel code that will do the same sort of array search as we saw in the Java. Here we have nested loops as in the Java. The Eiffel iteration mechanism uses the keywords from, until, loop, and end. After the from, you code any initialization code, like starting values for indexes. Under until, you code the exit condition for this loop, that is, the expression which, when true, will stop the iteration. Then between loop and end, you put the code to be executed on each iteration. And hopefully something in that code will eventually cause the exit condition to become true and the iteration stops. Notice that in this rendition, the test for whether the element we're searching for has been found is included after the until as part of the exit condition. And that makes sense. We want to stop looking once we find it. The same thing really happens in the Java, except that the break is used to bail out of the search in mid-iteration. And in fact, you could and probably should code it like this in Java. And maybe that's what the Java author meant when he criticized the labeled break. One of the most common sources of programming errors is coding iterations. That's justification enough to keep the complete exit condition in one place. But the Eiffel loop mechanism also includes optional elements, which can be used to characterize loop correctness. And you can read more about loop correctness in the Eiffel online documentation. As an aside, another thing you might find curious about this Eiffel code is how the indexes are incremented. In Java, you can use the C style I++ to increment I. In Eiffel, you have to code I gets I plus 1. There's a good reason for this that comes from Eiffel's support for design by contract. So if you haven't seen the design by contract presentations, I encourage you to do that. But for now, accept that you have to type a few more keystrokes to increment I in Eiffel. But then think of all the braces you don't have to type. Let me talk just a minute about nested classes. In Java, you can create a class inside of another class. Now, I'm not going to try to go over all the rules around nested classes here, but I do want to point out that a nested class has unlimited access to all its enclosing classes members, regardless of access modifiers. Now, this may sound odd at first, but it's actually in keeping with the Java policy, because a nested class is internal to the enclosing class, just like a class's routines, so it has full access. Also, if a nested class has an instance, that instance is embedded in the instance of the enclosing class. Because nested classes have access to their enclosing class's members, they can be used to improve the granularity of access. But you can also include modifiers on the nested class itself, just like other members, which serves to make the rules and options kind of dawning. Let me give you an example. Sun's Java tutorial has a quiz question on nested classes. It's a matching question in which you match six situations with six types of nested classes. I won't go through all the situations, nor will I reveal my own score, but just listen to the six choices of types of nested classes. Protected inner class, public static nested class, private inner class, private static nested class, protected static nested class, and anonymous inner class. So the combination of modifiers and nested classes introduces lots of subtleties that the Java programmer needs to understand. And the last thing I want to say about nested classes is that because they're always tied to some enclosing class, they don't really have a life cycle of their own. Consequently, they can evolve on their own into autonomous, reusable software assets. Now, in fairness to Java, I should point out that the intent of nested classes is to be used when the nested class makes sense only in the context of its enclosing class. But this reveals a difference in culture between Java and Eiffel. The Eiffel culture is highly reuse oriented. As a result, a developer tries not to impose any of his or her current perceptions on those who may in the future choose to reuse the developer's work. So in Eiffel, there are no nested classes. Even though each non-trivial class will be related to others, it does not belong to any other. And it's not necessary to have nested classes for access control purposes, because Eiffel's feature clause provides very precise access control. And any Eiffel class is free to grow and evolve on its own into a valuable reusable software component. 
Here's an area where Java and Eiffel act similarly, but because of Java's backward link to the C syntax, it's easy for programmers, particularly new Java programmers, to misunderstand what's going on. Because inheritance implies substitutability, we can always assign or attach an instance of some derived class to a variable with a type of some ancestor class. So suppose we have a declaration of type closed figure and one of type rectangle, and the class rectangle is derived from the class closed figure. Then it's valid to assign or attach an instance of the derived class, in this case my rectangle, to a declaration of the ancestor class type, in this case my closed figure. And this makes sense because every instance of rectangle is also an instance, though not a direct instance, of closed figure. But can we do the opposite? That is, assign my closed figure to my rectangle? Well, the answer is no. And that stands to reason, too, because we can't be sure that an instance attached to my closed figure at runtime will always be a rectangle. It could be some other type of closed figure. So instead of doing a direct assignment in Java, we would have to do a cast, like this. If the object currently attached to my closed figure is actually a rectangle, then the effect is the same as the assignment. That is, the rectangle attached to my closed figure is now also attached to my rectangle. But what happens at the time of the cast if the object currently attached to my closed figure is something other than a rectangle, say an ellipse? Well, a class cast exception occurs because the attempted assignment or cast was invalid. And of course, you can code all this in the try-catch structure to handle the possibility that this may happen. In Eiffel, things really work about the same way, maybe just a little friendlier. Here are our two declarations. We can attach my rectangle to my closed figure, no sweat. But as in Java, if we try to do the opposite, our compiler objects because we can't be sure at compile time that my closed figure will have a rectangle attached. So in Eiffel, rather than using the cast syntax, we use an assignment attempt operator. If my closed figure is attached to a rectangle, then it just does the assignment. But if my closed figure was some other closed figure, say an ellipse, then my rectangle is just left void rather than an exception occurring. This makes it easy and safe to work with objects when you won't be certain of their specific type at runtime. So, for example, if our goal was to take the object attached to my closed figure, and then if the object was a rectangle, print its diagonal, we could do this. If my rectangle is not void after the assignment attempt, then the assignment took place, and we can safely print my rectangle's diagonal. But I think the thing that bothers me about the cast is that it's been thought of since the days of C and C++ as a conversion, and most of us remember how troublesome that can be. Hmm, let me take this nuclear submarine and pretend it's an array of integers for a while. Well, casts are still actually thought of as conversions in Java, and in fact they are conversions for primitive types. But for class types, they're really just type-safe reference assignments. And I think the cast means conversion mindset makes this easy to misunderstand. Okay, I promise to quit talking really soon now. Thanks for hanging with me. We looked at the important contribution of Java technology to computing. And although Java was not necessarily first in all these areas, no one can argue about Java's significant effect on today's software industry. We saw that Java's syntax is based on that of C, but it brings much of its object model from Smalltalk. We looked at the Java syntax and language features next to those of Eiffel, and we found some areas in which Java's C-style syntax and lack of advanced features, like properties, multiple inheritance, and design by contract, cause it to be more complex and difficult to learn and use than Eiffel. These shortcomings also affect the quality of the software product, particularly in the areas of reliability and reusability. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and found it informative. If you're a Java programmer, you may also be interested in viewing the Eiffel and C-Sharp presentation.